Hello, welcome to Science Shambles, Sunday Science Shambles, Sunday Shambles, you call it what you want. Uh, we're here at 10am most Sundays uh, by we, I mean myself and Helen Chersky, who you're going to meet in a moment. And uh, you're also going to meet shortly our special guest this week who uh, has been on this before. And we've done lots of was on the, the, the 24 hour, which ended up being 25 hour uh, live science show that we did uh, at the end of last year and in lots of other things as well. Lots of uh, Nine Lessons of Carols for Curious People and various others, Dr. Carl, but you're going to meet him shortly. Um, just quickly mention, if you have any questions that you would like to ask during the show, we've had loads sent in already, but if you have questions you'd like to ask, you suddenly think, oh, I must know this now, then just tweet those questions to at Cosmic Shambles, or you can also pop them in the live chat, and our producer, Trent, will make sure that I see them. If you are able to support us for our Patreon, and you don't already, that will be absolutely fantastic, because obviously we're still kind of muddling through uh, the uh, not good year for show business uh, or science show business uh, or any of those things. Uh, so if you're able to support us via Patreon, go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. And uh, there's loads of other stuff as well. If you if you don't support us via Patreon, you won't know about things like Tips for Existence, where uh, recent episodes include uh, Rusty Schweikart from uh, Apollo 9, uh, who's always just a fascinating person to talk to. And uh, also other astronauts include uh, Nicole Stott, uh, we've had it on, and uh, uh, also, we've had Neil Gaiman and Brian Green and Andrea and, and loads more. So all of that is available if you support us for our Patreon, as well as doing lots of things like having uh, you can actually watch us make the shows live, uh, for instance, last week or even this week. Uh, talk to David McColman, uh, the brilliant singer, songwriter and art historian who will be next week's Tips for Existence and also the Uncanny Hour series that I did with Stuart Lee and Mark Gatiss and Toya Wilcox and various others. So there's loads of stuff if you support us via Patreon. So if you can, please do. This will always be available for free, whatever. Uh, and I should also mention our very special guest on Tips for Existence uh, this week uh, was Helen Chersky, where we talked about lots of things that we've never talked about before, certainly not on this, but also about the, the makings of, of a scientist and her experience at school and how she became the inquisitive person that she is was it nature or nurture well it turns out it's probably a muddle between the two but you know that already um also uh, tonight at 8 p.m there'll be one of my billion thought shows i've got about 10,000 uh words so far of notes they're all just kind of one sentence things so we'll see how many of the 36 pages i can get through tonight so that's a billion thoughts um that is at 8 p.m live tonight and there'll be a q a and stuff like that as well uh next week we're going to do something uh, about conspiracy thinking and superstitious thinking. In fact, I had a very interesting conversation with a guy called Lee McIntyre uh, the other day about his book, How to Argue with uh, a Science Denier, which is filled with some really excellent and interesting advice about what it is as human beings uh, that makes us sometimes suspicious, paranoid or drawn to conspiracy thinking. And um, that'll pretty much do it, I reckon. Helen Chersky, how are you? I'm doing very well. I was just thinking, as you said that, um, calling your new show A Billion Thoughts is one of the most intellectually honest things you've ever done. Not that you're not intellectually honest the rest of the time, but it is the most accurate reflection <laughs> of what's going on in your brain. I, I hope so. I, I keep scribbling off the, the, the notes. Of that, that, because that's, that's the brilliant thing about humans, humans is there are billions and billions uh, to use a Carl Sagan phrase of ideas and we might as well talk about all of them all at once um, so I have a This Week in Science which is not just for the first time in the how long have we been doing this now it's been a long time it's uh, nearly like, a year and a half now yes yeah, not far off 18 months yeah um, for the first time I don't just have an on this week in science I have on this day in science it's the first time the day actually matches up because it was on the 15th of August in 1934 that William Beebe and uh, Otis Barton made their the one of the first that the, their record breaking at the time deep sea dive in a bathosphere uh, so they went under the ocean surface in a metal sphere and they'd been they'd been sort of experimenting for a few years and a lot of people thought they were bonkers um, and they that was the one where they got to 922 feet and this was in 1934 so that's a long way back so this is you know this is 30 or 40 years before Jacques Cousteau um and they'd gone through this adventure of you know no one that at that time deep sea biologists were very much well you know we fish it out of a net with a net and then we know everything there is to know about it and Bibi was like well 
what if it swims funny? You know, what if it's actually doing something interesting while it's down there? Um, and so they they did a series of dives with this this steel sphere that was 40 centimetres thick on the edges. And the, these two, by all accounts, quite tall men sort of squeezed into it with two windows, a big searchlight looking out at all the fish in the ocean. And um, uh, and they that so the, their record breaking dive was um, this day in 1934. And the thing that was interesting about it is that they it was the first time a public fuss had been made about it. Like they were William Beebe certainly was seen as a showman. You know, he was he was one of those people. It, he would be on shambles probably today, but he was one of those characters in history who he wasn't just a scientist writing dry kind of papers. You know, he had he was out on the New York jazz scene and he was, uh, you know, partying all over the place and multiple marriages and, a, you know, constantly evolving personal life and all of that kind of stuff. And at the same time as having this, in, this fascination with the ocean. And so he was one of the, the ones who made it human, like who brought the oceans to life. And in fact, he was the generation that then inspired people like Sylvia Earle and, and Jacques Cousteau, because the book that he wrote on the basis of the things he saw then showed other people there was something to look at. But it was really 30 or 40 years before then Jacques Cousteau did the next wave of um, public thing, public sort of talking about it. And I just wanted to mention an article that he wrote in 1932 for Natural uh, National Geographic, and it was called A Wanderer Under the Sea which I thought was just a fabulous title. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's this week in science. It was William Beebe and Otis Barton getting down to 922 metres in their bathsphere, looking at the ocean for the first time. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I was just going to mention, by the way, I did Shambles at the beginning, and uh, I think a lot of people listening to this will, or watching this will enjoy this week's book, Shambles. We've uh, had uh, the author, Catherine Massal, on, and uh, her book is uh, Mother of Invention, How I Good Ideas Get Ignored in an Economy Built for Men, which is very interesting about how certain... It starts off with the wheeled suitcase, uh, which is a far more fascinating story than you might imagine, and then gets into things like the electric car, and uh, I would really recommend recommend you listen to that uh, book shambles again that's freely available to uh, to everyone and uh yeah it was it was a fascinating book now on fascinating books uh some people write one fast fascinating book some people do seven fascinating books some people make it to 10 some people make it to 47 fascinating books uh in many ways the bertrand russell of his generation in terms of the number of books he's written it's dr carl hello carl, hello carl. dr carl Ahoy, Dr. Robin and Helen, Doctor, doc, real Dr. Helen. You've got a PhD, whereas I'm not a real doctor. Uh, and I'll just be honoured to you, Dr. Robin. You say the nicest things. But that is for, uh, so the, the latest book is because I don't think we've had any shows where you haven't just finished writing a new book. And this is the little book of climate change science, which obviously is, is going to be a very important book because this is still something which a lot of people skirt over or think I haven't got time for now. And we're frequently misled uh, in the mass media. So, you know, I presume some of those things were the drive to write that book. Yes, uh, I wrote my first story on climate change in 1981 and i've been doing following it for a while um and the good news is that we can both stop and reverse global warming we can bring the rising carbon dioxide levels and the climate back down to what they were in the 20th century with the technology of today we don't need new technology all we need is politicians who see this as an imperative and uh, the fossil fuel companies used to be the major supporters, this was a big surprise to me, they were the major supporters of climate change science until 1990. They even voluntarily did not uh, open up the world's largest gas field because it would have become by itself the source of 1% of the entire planet's carbon dioxide emissions because the gas was 30% methane and 70. And then in 1990, they changed. And for the last 30 years, they've been spending up to a billion dollars a year telling lots of lies about climate change. And it's kind of like that Bob Dylan song. They've thrown, they've hurled the worst fear that can ever be hurled, the fear to bring children into the world. And so on one hand, I do school shows all the time. And when I do, you know, at least three a week, and when I do the primary school kids and I ask them what they want, they say, and these are kids who are eight years old, and they say, I want things to be the way they were in the 20th century. When, for example, we didn't have one fifth of all the forests in Australia burn. And the, so they're treating the world like their little toy and they've embedded 
knowing that climate change was real, they've embedded fossil fuels everywhere, um, knowing that they were doing a bad thing, just so that a few dozen companies could get fabulously wealthy. And this book finishes off with an optimistic thing. We can fix it. We just need different politicians. It's interesting because I know an Australian filmmaker, formerly actor Damon Gamow, who made the, uh, the movie uh, and has also recently made a movie about the fact that, as you just said, all of the technology is is out there. It just needs the wherewithal and it needs endeavour to, 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 to be used. And, and he said he had to make that film because he has young kids, exactly as you were saying, uh, the problem that you know, they, they, they worry about these things. And he thought, well, I want to make a movie that's not just saying these are the problems. I want to say, look, the answers are there. And then once people know that, I think that they will have an even greater. I mean, we've, we've talked about this a lot of times before, but in the UK, I do think, you know, there is a problem with the fact that the 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 London Science Museum is sponsored by three different fossil fuel companies. And that seems to send out a very bad message for the time being. Yeah, they've very successfully embedded themselves everywhere. And they offer many solutions. Um, and every single solution involves burning more fossil fuel. And so we had uh, headlines in the papers recently that the best way to reduce global emissions was to open up more Australian coal mines. That is a very Australian argument, I have to say. I don't know, who, the, the Australians must be the only people who could even consider writing an article like that. Um, everyone else is a bit more down on coal mines. Mm, well, like it's, um, which, it's I'm historically been a much bigger part of your economy. It has been. We've dumbed down ourselves a lot. Unlike you guys, like I just love your science museum, regardless of how it's been brought down. Because you guys have got such a good history. I mean, you do have, you Britisher people, the United Kingdomese, you do have the unique honour of having invaded more countries than anybody else in the world. And you're up against the Americans who have invaded one country every 14 months for the last 250 years of their history. And their longest period of peace adds up to only 21 months. And you're still ahead of them. Do you know what? That's one of the great things, isn't it, about them? Always wanting to help to a country help yeah. maybe pick up some of the heavier minerals that have been weighing that country down <laughs> bring them over here just to lighten their load oh yeah um the uh, so that that book is out now isn't it the uh, the little book of uh, climate science yeah and electronically as well so you can read it there fantastic and what is your show and tell today well, it's an intellectual show and tell. I've been having fun with TikTok. Now, the thing about TikTok that fascinates me is that one third of the people are under the age of 14 and two thirds are female and they can be told lies. So I've decided I would go in there and tell them truth, such as if you're having mixed drinks, a diet rum and cola will get you drunker than a regular rum and cola. Um, and did that, that got about 5 million views. And so I've gone from my peak of 5 million views down to my latest one, which is a, I'm sorry to say, it's a found poem based on my book. And I will read only two stanzas out of the 15 because I don't want to break your heart. And here we go. Um, and I'll tell you how badly received it was by TikTok. <laughs> it's called Sunlight and Wind are Free. It's by um, L. O'Keefe. Sunlight and wind are free a kind of glue. Your loudspeaker simultaneously broadcasts molten iron in precise quantities. A kind of glue, adding seaweed. Molten iron in precise quantities, not paying for the future. There's 13 more stanzas based on phrases taken out of my book. And this, uh, let me just give you the heartbreaking statistics. Instead of millions of views, it's had 6,900, oh, and the average viewing time out of 180 seconds was 8.1. So the average person clicks on and goes, what the hell is this crap? And switches it off. Luckily, 48 people did actually watch it all the way through. And I think they might be the new poets of the next generation, which is just a lovely thing. So on one hand, I'm, I sort of was hoping it would get more, but it's, I think it's getting through to some people whose lives will make it better. Anyway, that is my intellectual show and tell. I think you're just going through your Van Gogh period. You know, it's that <laughs> ignored now, but uh, that that poetry will be there with E.E. E. Cummings and, and many more afterwards. The uh, I love the fact that you, after you said, you know, and I found out two thirds of the uh, audience is under 14. So I've been putting up information about drinking rum. Yeah. So, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> OK, let, let me comment. OK, so OK, so. Uh, I will, we do not. Uh, this came to me that our society is drenched in alcohol. So I was was um, gate crashing Dickie's party. You know Dickie. 
No. Richard Branson. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> uh, so I was gatecrashing his party in Mumbai. By the way, the way you gatecrash a party is you arrange a bunch of you, you're all well dressed, and then what you do is you wait for a big crowd of people come behind you, and then you immediately come in smiling without an invitation, and then you walk towards the redicops. You don't try to avoid them. You walk towards them, and you do not tell a lie. You simply say a noun, family. If they want to think that you're family with Dickie, that's fine. And there's a big crowd of people, so they shove you through. And, it, and he launched a $5 billion phone network, and he came down a building, and he got caught in the ebb sales, blah, blah, blah. It was a big thing. And I couldn't work out what was wrong. And there was no alcohol. Our society is so drenched in anything that to celebrate, you have a glass of alcohol. Um, if you had a bad day, you'll have a drink. If you had a good day, you'll have a drink. And yet we do not know how to use this legal drug. And the overwhelming majority of people in our society do not know that if they have a rum and cola, whether if the diet one will get them drunker than the regular one. And, and so, so why we is that, Carl? Because your stomach pumps its contents through into the small intestine where stuff is absorbed, not at a volume rate. It's pumped through at an energy rate. And how the heck does a stomach know does a stomach know to pump out three to four kilocalories per minute? Nobody knows, but it does it. And so that means if you have a rum and diet coke, it's got half the calories or kilojoules of a rum and regular coke. So they've both got the same amount of alcohol but it sits in your stomach longer and two things happen. Firstly, it gets released more slowly and so it has a slower rise curve, the regular sugared one because it's got more calories. But secondly, to some degree, the alcohol gets broken down. Imagine the situation of two identical twins who've done everything the same for their whole lives. They go to a party, they have three rum and cokes, but one has three rum and regular cokes, leaves the party, gets pulled over by the cops, blood alcohol level is 0.03, waves on their way. The one with the rum and diet cokes is pulled over by the cops is 0.055. Bit of a miscarriage of justice ends up in jail, gets very friendly with a very large man who has love and hate on tattooed on their knuckles, ends up getting nominated and brought into the Hells Angels and ends up outside your kids or your nephew's or niece's primary school on the back of a big Harley with a big beer gut selling the methamphetamines because our society does not teach the people in our society that diet drinks get you drunker. This is great. You've gone straight from Van Gogh to Hunter S. Thompson. I love the speed of change here. The, let's get on to the first. Uh, that is a fascinating thing. That, and also one of the, as we know, the, the ethics committees are always very wary of twin studies. But that's the first twin study that I've heard involving rum. So that's that's fascinating. I feel I should also point out at this point, the Hells Angels are actually not nearly as, not always nearly as scary as they look. Because the, the only time, well, this is very quick, but the only time I, ever, time I ever met one was filming in America, they all rocked up in a in a parking lot car park. I was terrified, scooted into the nearest shop, came back out. The cameraman who had this little toy Kermit the Frog, who got photographed in lots of places, the cameraman was photographing one of the Hells Angels with Kermit the Frog on his shoulder. And he just walked up to him, this British guy, I've got this frog. Can I can I photograph you with my frog? And this this massive, great big Hells Angel, you know, knife on his thing, tattoos everywhere was like, all right. And they were having a nice chat because of Kermit the Frog. So I think it's all, I don't recommend approaching people you're scared of who might be carrying knives, but with a frog, it is possible that they you might discover they're a real human being and not a scary one. That's all I'm saying. Oh, so that means that we should immediately drop millions of frogs across Afghanistan to make the transition into peace more gentle. At this point, I think the international community will take any ideas going. Thank you. <laughs> so remember there from now on, hashtag not all hell's angels. Yeah. Uh, so let's have the, f the first question is from Anya, who is six years old. And Anya had a helium balloon at her party recently. And she wondered, how do we get helium on Earth? Also, if helium is lighter than air, why does it not get squashed to the ground by the air molecules? So, Dr. Carl? Um, we get helium as a byproduct from oil wells. Sorry, sorry from gas wells. And it comes out at a very low percentage and it can be filtered off. The reason they go to the trouble of filtering it off is that it has enormous uses. It used to be used for lift in balloons, but now it's mainly used for MRI scanners and the like. For many years, helium was regarded as an important strategic um, element or, or substance or mineral not quite mineral, in the USA, but then it got privatised and now we're running low on helium. Um, so that's how they get it, from gas wells. 
there's a sort of there's a bit there's a slightly further back answer to that which is that um it it is lost all the time it's lost to outer space very very slowly but there is still a bit of helium around because it's replenished by radioactive um uh elements decaying within the Earth's crust and the consequence of their decay is that they produce what become helium atoms, helium ah. nuclei. So there is, is there, there, there is a source of helium that is constantly being refreshed from inside the Earth and that finds its way out. So, so, th so there is, it is absolutely true, it's lost to space because it's very light, it, it disappears to the top of the atmosphere and gets lost, but there's another source in from the bottom. Uh, so that's why we, we have a continual supply of helium, but it is in short supply. Dr. Helen, is, is that what they call in physics alpha decay? So the alpha particles, yeah, helium nuclei, yeah. So it's, it's constant radioactive decay that throws off alpha particles, which become helium nuclei. And so even though it's, so you do have a constant new source of it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Anya. I hope that answers. Uh, the next question is from I Petroni, who says, uh, I know this, it starts off by saying, I know this is probably really basic. And I say to everyone watching this, don't worry about whatever your question is. Don't think, oh, that's probably really basic. Because actually a lot of very basic questions are ones that we never learn at school. And we then pass through our life then being too worried to ask that question because we think we should know it. Don't be scared of whatever question you have to ask. If it comes from a place of curiosity, we are happy to try and answer. Well, I say we, Helen and Dr. Carl are happy to try and answer it. And I sit most of these out. Uh, but I Petroni would like to know, he says, uh, I don't understand how it's possible to have an electric field in a vacuum. Helen. So electric, so fields are a slightly what? weird concept in a way, because what, what, it, what it means when a physicist says a field is that it's something that's got a number at every position in space. So if I was to take the temperature of the room, for example, maybe it's a bit cooler near the window and warmer near the door, at every point in space, there's a measurement of temperature and that is a field. So with an electric field, um, there is, because of the way space works, there is the potential for an electric field, but it could be zero anywhere. But the point is it's got a number everywhere in space. Everywhere you go, you can say, what is the electric field here? Not is the one, but what is it? It might be zero, but it's still there. So basically, you can imagine um, empty space with genuinely no other atoms in it as um, a sort of background level of zeros. But if you generate a ripple in it on one side, some of those zeros tick up. Um, and that's your electric wave going past that you get a little positive wave that goes to a negative wave. And so you have this movement through space of positives and negatives where there were previously zeros. And there's that, you can have that anywhere in space. So you don't need any atoms to have an electric field at all. All you have is that um, once you've had a bit of a kick, which gives you a positive, it can be followed by a bit of a negative and then you've got a wave that moves. So that's what light is. That's light. And you need magnetism as well. So you have both electric and magnetic fields working together. So you don't actually need matter to have those values to have the, that to have a number like that everywhere in space so you can obviously add atoms in and then your waves that your electric waves your waves of electric field that are going through or your photons can into they can nudge that matter they can bump into it they can scatter off it they can completely ignore it um but they're sort of traveling through the background it's a bit like if you imagine a piece of fabric that's got objects on it and you wait you sort of rip put a ripple in the fabric and the ripple travels underneath all the objects well the objects are like the matter they're still there the ripples are kind of going through and around them but the ripples are in the background state not not part of the matter itself it is it is quite a tricky philosophical question that gets into some quite deep things in physics um but you don't need matter to have a field of any kind Dr. Carl, into that. Um, Helen, Dr. Helen, does a field, besides having a numerical quantity at any point in space, which was a gorgeous explanation, does it have to have a direction as it well? It doesn't have to have, but it can have. So a temperature field is a scalar field. It just has a value. But a vector field, which an electromagnetic field is, and vector is just a word for a little arrow in space. So then it has a direction as, as well. well. So electro, electric fields and magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields, always have a direction as well as a value. Um, which is why you can have polarization because as an electric field travels, it can travel with the wheels one way or it, the arrow is pointing, you know, left and right, or it can travel with the arrows pointing up and down. So yes, you can have a field which has a direction, but not all of them do. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm going to take Steve's question now. This is to you, first of all, Dr. Carl. Steve wonders, he says, sometimes out of the corner of my eye, some screens appear to flicker, but when I look directly at them, they don't. Do rods and cones in different places in the eye, eye sorry, fire and reset at different rates? 
Or Correct. The uh, uh, flicker well. fusion rate is the term you're looking for, for. And let's forget the rod. So in your eye, roughly a globe, roughly 25 millimetres an inch of golf ball in diameter, you have in each eyeball a layer called the retina, which is 0.3 of a millimetre thick, and it covers most of the inside. In the daytime, you almost certainly use just the cones. And the way I remember it is C for cone, C for colour, and they operate over the colour band from 400 to 700 nanometers. And we have, most of us, three different types of cones that are sensitive at different uh, uh, wavelengths. The blue at 440 nanometers, the green at 525, the red at 575. Forget the rods, they're at night time. Now, they have different, and here comes the term, flicker fusion rate. If I show you one frame of my whole day photos um, per second, you go, they, they, I'm seeing flickering. But if I get up to about 25, you see it as a continuous thing. Now, in the center of your view, I forget the exact number, but I think it's sort of like about 20 or so, 18 or 20. In the center of your field of view, once you get up to about 18 or 20 or some number around there, the individual still pictures become a continuous seamless thing. But the flicker fusion rate is lower on the corner of your eye. And so in New York, when I was traveling on the subway, I found, and by the way, on the subway, uh, I thought, that's weird. They just look like Edison screws. What's to stop somebody from stealing them? And so I asked the person next to me and he said, try it. And I did. They put them on with a special counterclockwise thread so they won't fit into the screws that you have at home. So I was looking at these things and they're running on a lower frequency and looking straight at them, they didn't flicker. But out of the corner of my eye, they did. You are totally correct, Steve. Your flicker fusion rate is lower on the periphery of your field of view. Brilliant. You said they're about frames per second. Films, uh, 24 frames per second, uh, I think. Uh, used, to be, that used to be the standard, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. Uh, they've, they've actually increased, increased it now. So the higher the higher um, quality formats do have a higher rate, but I think it's a very small number of people that can tell the difference. There's ah, also but, a very odd thing about the fact that yeah. when on television, they would run, uh, I think, at 25, uh, the equivalent of 25 frames per second. So, because uh, I remember when I was a kid and I was like taping things off the telly and I would look up the length of a film and then I would go oh hang on a minute actually this is a hundred minute film but that means it'll run at 95 minutes I think when it's on television oh that's, really yeah. that's, I didn't know the recording and the broadcasting were different yeah it's so, so it's actually slightly <laughs> uh slightly faster or used to be I don't know if that's still true because obviously the technology has changed a great deal since when I was young um sorry Dr Carl did you want to add something yeah so they would they would uh, shoot them at 24 and in America their frequency is 30 frames per second on their electrical grid. So everything was shot at 24, played back at 24. But in Australia, where we run at, 20, at 50 frames a second, 50 cycles per second, it was really easy to make an electronic circuit that would then drop at 25. So that's why the 24 frames a minute movies were played at 25 because it was cheaper to make a circuit that would run at half the local mains frequency. What's your mains frequency in the UK? 50 or 60? Oh, I don't know, Helen. Uh, oh, you've caught me there. I think it's, I think it's 50 here, isn't it? I work so much with American, both American and British systems. Uh, I think it's 50 hertz, yeah, hmm. in the UK. So that's why you had the 24-25 mismatch because it was so cheap just simply to halve the frequency and then use that to run your um, movie projector. So for everyone out there who's still recording things off television on VHS or Betamax, we've given you a useful piece of advice. Although to anyone who's still recording stuff onto VHS, you deserve a medal for maintaining <laughs> uh, classic technology, I feel. Some, some people are traditionalists. This is uh, Rob Tilsley would like to know. He says, do our eyes have chromatic aberration? I thought I could see green fringing around the moon last night. Perhaps I was just imagining it. So chromatic aberration. So, we start? Oh, go on, Helen, yeah. Well, so, so um, we should explain first what chromatic aberration is. Uh, and what, what it is, is that if you have a, a lens, so you imagine a kind of classic lens, which is kind of um, bulging out a bit on both sides and it will focus an image to a point. Um, you can measure exactly, say you take a red laser beam, you can measure exactly uh, what point 
the lens will focus that light to. So you send a light, you send uh, not a laser beam, but a red light on one side, and it goes through the lens, and then it will come back to a to a sharp point, to a single focused image. And so you can measure exactly how far that is for red light. But if you move to green light and then blue light, the, that focal length changes ever so slightly. So if you have a simple lens system, then you can't have everything, all the colors perfectly in uh, all light, all focused at exactly the same plane. And that's why camera lenses are really expensive. It's because they've got multiple lenses in. So, you know, if you look at the 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 the. On the old, you know, there's big old cameras where you had you could change the lens on the front. They've got multiple lenses inside to correct for this problem, so that all the colours come back into focus at exactly the same point. So that's what chromatic aberration is. Um, I think we do have a little bit of chromatic aberration, but it's really small because the um, the pupil of our eye is really small, so the aperture is really small, um, but also the lens is very close to the back of our eye to the retina. So I think chromatic aberration in humans is minimal. What I do think about the green thing around the moon is that that is probably an atmospheric effect that is due to light to ice crystals or to water um, droplets in the atmosphere causing a ring. So I would say that was probably a thing that was outside that person's eye rather than inside it. The thing that I find most disappointing about uh, and uh, our perception of it was finding out that it basically fades with age. And I know, obviously, we all might have different experiences of what we see when we see red. But apparently, you know, when my son, who's 13, when he sees red, uh, he will be seeing a, a, a deeper red or a more vibrant red than the red that I, I see. So literally, so life literally does become more grey as you get older. That's very, that's very sad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, uh, um, anyway, the uh, uh, Nesta would like, oh, oh, Dr. Carl. Yeah, so in the eyes lensing system, you've got the cornea with an optical power of about 35 or 40 diopters, and that's not adjustable. And then behind that, you have the lens, which when you're young can adjust between two and 18 diopters. And then as you get older, because the lens keeps on growing more cells, the lens gets stiffer, and so this flexibility goes down. And by the time you're 40, you've got a range of only two diopters. By the time you're 70, you've got one diopter. But the lens, the eye is remarkably good. And Helen, I think, I agree with her uh, that the almost certainly what you're seeing is, um, and I know this phrase because I used to be a TV weatherman, um, you were having, and you were taught to roll this out, high altitude hexagonal ice crystals uh, at high altitude. And they then get the light from the sun. The light from the sun is predominantly green. And it lands on the moon, which is pretty black, and reflects it. So if you're in a dark adapted area and you can get, you won't be seeing this with your rods, but if you can have enough light to stimulate your cones, you can see this moon bow. And if you're very careful, if you're very lucky, you can see a bit of greenness. Or alternatively, it could be something wonky, wonky with your eyes. And what happens with age, by the way, is that you end up with the um, yellowing of the eye and you get the cataract situation. And so there are many famous painters who have had cataracts removed and then suddenly they paint so vibrantly again. Well, there's well, a famous I... example, isn't there? Is it, is it, is it Monet who had the, had, had the lenses of his eye removed and everything became purple? All his, all his drawings went very purple because he could suddenly see ultraviolet, which is oh. one of the things your lens cuts out, is it cuts out UV. And because he had it removed, he could then see ultraviolet. And so the colours, everything shifts to the purple. So it's an extreme way to gain a, a superstar, you know, su a super sensing vision. But it, it, apparently it does work. You can't focus very well on anything, but you can see UV. Yeah, the the, 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 sorry, yeah. Jessica. Yeah. Oh, sorry, during the second, we discovered that you could uh, put an artificial lens into the eye because young British pilots were getting shot at during the Second World War. And bullets would hit their aeroplanes and bits of metal and perspex, uh, which the Americans don't call perspex, they call it something else that will come to me in a minute, would go everywhere, including into their eye. Now, the eye is a highly, because it's part of the brain, highly immunoprotective area. And blow me down, Perspex did not set off an immune reaction. All you had to do was remove the lens, which had gone yellow, get a bit of Perspex, which you couldn't adjust, and then carve it to the right shape and pop it in. You can do it in 15 minutes. But we discovered that because of pilots in the Second World War ending up with bits of Perspex in their eyeballs. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Cole. You are watching.
Science Shambles uh, with myself, Alan Chersky, and Dr. Cole. Uh, if you're able to, uh, please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Cosmic Shambles. We've got loads of new things uh, coming up. Go to our Cosmic Shambles site and get some kind of sense of uh, the things that we are creating. And uh, now we're going to have a question from Nesta. Nesta would like to know, which is the more realistic way of producing clean energy in the near future, considering the current environmental crisis? Dr. Carl. Uh, very, very easy. Go to the website drawdown.org and there you can download a 20 megabyte document with 110 pages and it runs through the options. It has involved with it. You might have run across to Professor Hella, Professor Kehoe, Kehoe um, and she's a climate scientist who is also a Republican and married to a minister of religion in Texas. And so she can speak the language and she's uh, and so there's just a whole uh, thing, a bunch of things we can do. Overwhelmingly, we can get all the electricity we need. That's about one third of the world's carbon emissions come from electricity and heat generation. We can get them from renewables in 10 years and that will come from action at a federal level. And the best example is the 7th of December 1941 when Pearl Harbor got bombed and from the Americans moved from having made 3,000 planes in the last half century to making 300,000 planes in the next four years. And so from the American point of view, their part of the war was won as much in the machine shop as with the machine gun. The point is renewables will do everything we need if we have a worldwide grid. Uh, well, so on the specifics then, so renewables at the moment in the UK, 41% of our electric gener electricity generation this year is already renewables. The, so the thing about renew renewables is that there is no one best technology, and this is something the world's going to have to get used to, that there isn't a golden body, oh, we just do this. Um, since nuclear fusion hasn't yet been made scalable, um, it's, there's going to be different solutions in different places. So it's going to become very dependent on where you are, and there is no, this is best. Um in the, UK, so in the UK, what renewables are really good at is um, they produce a lot of energy, but what they don't do is something you can turn on and off at will. So what you need, actually, the big thing that is coming down the line is storage solutions. Because what you want is when you've got a wind turbine, you want to be collecting that energy all the time, even if no one needs it at that point. And so um, the energy supply supply that you're going to need is going to be paired with a storage solution so if you've got a wind farm maybe you'll turn that into green hydrogen maybe you'll put it in a battery maybe you'll put it into a sort of big rotating thing that stores rotational energy um so renewables can do the job but only if you have what we call base load power which is the absolute backup that is always there and at the moment that's what the fossil fuels are doing that the renewables can't do but if we improve storage technologies uh, then what, however you get your energy you can store it up when it's plentiful and then you can use it as your base load when it's not um, and this is the reason that there is a debate about nuclear power because nuclear power is very good as a base load it obviously has other downsides it doesn't emit carbon so there's a there's, there is a debate about how you view nuclear power in this thing but basically wind and solar will get us a long long way and then there are other local solutions uh, depending on where you are depending on how remote you are and what the weather is and what the climate is where you're like um, but wind and solar can do a huge amount of the heavy lifting here but we do need the storage solutions to go with it and they're being built it's all all these technologies are on the way and we can get to some of them very very quickly um so yes but but wind and solar are going to do the majority of the heavy lifting i'm going to go straight through the next question now this is from blue mountains atheist uh, dr carl and this i think is probably one of the the questions that many many atheists have been asking in the blue mountains for some time now and that question is where do farts go when you hold them in um they give you bad breath. So it is not yet. OK, so firstly, the ancient Romans had a thing called a diverticulum. So they had these long straight roads. And every now and then there was a turn off to one side and you would go down this long pathway. And then at the end would be a roundabout. And there would be everything that you needed to keep you provided for the next day, food and drink and horses supply and food. And then you'd go on. So you go into this out pouching called a diverticulum. This name is also used for a condition in the gut where you get a bulge coming out the side. And it was thought that holding in the farts could cause diverticular, the plural. And at the moment, the thinking is probably not, but 
the gas does cross the membranes and go into your bloodstream and to a minor degree can cause some degree of bad breath. But overwhelmingly bad breath is caused by other causes, but it can, so it can end up there coming out through your mouth. We should right. perhaps add what happens when they go out is that the average lifetime of methane in the atmosphere is seven years. So, um, you know, it's a natural human function, but um, every time you've done it for the last seven years, statistically speaking, still in the atmosphere somewhere. It's not it's a somewhere. hero's death, though, is it? I mean, it's not going to e even if you do hold them in for, for the sake of the planet, somehow that's the story when Mark that it's going to be written about very differently um <laughs> linda scotty who's aged eight hello uh linda as uh, she would like to know could a static shock ever be so severe to actually cause you harm dr carl uh, i reckon it could um the brain runs on many things it runs on a blood supply and it runs on hormones and it runs on electricity and i'm reckoning that it could the way that in general that electricity kills you is that you have electricity coming through many times per second. Now, the current in your heart that causes the muscles to contract is, I, I can't remember, I think it's of the order of maybe 30 or 50. It's related to the so-called safety switches, which are core balance relay detectors, but say it's about 30 milliamps. And so when your heart beats, that's being triggered by this current of 30 milliamps. It comes from the neck down to the uh, atria, the sinoatrial node above your heart and then to the atrioventricular node into your heart and then to the actual muscles in your left ventricles and it causes it to contract. It turns out that around 110 to 240 volts will give a current of about the same magnitude as your heart normally uses to fire, but it's coming through 50 or 60 times a second and you go into the so-called fibrillation, which is like a sort of a bag of worms and not effectively moving. Um, look, I don't know, Helen, I'm guessing that a single shock could set you off. And, and I'm, the reason I'm thinking of this is that we keep on having cases of healthy young athletes, male and female, who suddenly drop dead. And what we are working out backwards is they have a tendency to go into fibrillation anyway, and I'm thinking that that could cause problems. Helen, help me on this one. So I don't, I think the athletes things are separate. Uh, that's that's with the internal workings of the heart. The thing about static electricity is that in order to have it, so there's two things here, which which we should probably clarify, which is static electricity is electricity, you know, they're, they're kind of electrons um, or the absence of electrons that's built up on the surface and you touch it and suddenly all the electrons rush to wherever they weren't. But you can only move as many electrons as there were to start with. The, so the so the so if you touch you know if you have a um, if you're charged one of those kind of metal balls you get at science fairs and it's charged up and you touch it and you get a spike the only the the maximum that can move is what was built up on it to start with and it's really hard it's really really hard to build up loads of electrons in a static place because they tend to leak away into the atmosphere so actually most static shocks you come across are probably safe purely because it's almost it's so unlikely that you would come up across against something which has built up enough charge to do you any damage you do the most extreme examples you get are in really dry environments so i used to live in um, rhode island in america and in the winter when it was super dry and super cold touching my car because that was the only time i've ever owned a car in america um was that was what would generate a shock and it's because charge could build up but it took a really extreme uh environment for that to happen so the other thing that is separate which is separate to the question but we should probably just clarify is that you can also have a continual supply so so if you stick your finger in a plug as carl was saying you get a positive and a negative and a positive and a negative and it's oscillating backwards and forwards but in theory you could have a battery which just keeps dumping charge on you and that could probably do a bit more damage if there was enough of it um, if, the, if it could, if it produced a high enough current, it's not the voltage, it's the current. So static electricity is unlikely to be able to build up enough to do any harm unless you're really trying, basically. Ah, so Helen, what about the military industrial situation of, and you would know about this more than me, a Van de Graaff generator? So Van de Graaff generators are still, it's only what you can build up on the outside of the sphere. So Ah. Van de Graaff generators are those things that you probably saw at school where there's a kind of little belt that runs below and there's this sort of metal 
helmet at the top and the belt runs and then every so often if you touch the metal thing it you get you get a shock or you can generate a spark but they can only build up to a certain amount so basically that belt runs and there's friction and it, it adds electrons and it adds electrons but then they start leaking away and at some point the rate at which they're added is equal to the rate at which they're leaking away into the air so even a van de Graaff generator can only generate a certain amount it, it's only as many as electrons as it's got on it and, and once you can't put any more there, then it doesn't go any higher. So that's the maximum you can get. And it, and it will all be discharged in a single spike. Now, this is this is an interesting one because it's something I've, I've been thinking about quite a lot as well. This is from Scruffy45. He says, uh, this might be a question without an answer. Whenever I finish something like a big jar of pasta sauce, I rinse and wash it out thoroughly so it can be recycled. But lately I've been thinking, is the amount of water used to wash out the jar just as unsustainable as if I just threw the jar straight into the trash? And so that's uh, because sometimes, especially some of the very small items that you might be recycling and the effort involved and the power required and then the whole kind of landfill issue. I don't know who, Helen, do you, or, or Dr. Carl, so do you want to? Oh, I sorry, did, go on, Helen. Well, I did read something on, on half of this because half of this is whether you should wash it and the other half of it is how much energy does it take to wash, wash it. And I, I definitely did read an article recently that said that washing it definitely makes it, is, makes it easier at the other end when they're recycling it. It is definitely it uses less energy at the other end if it's clean going in. So, so there's also the consideration that if you if what goes into the recycling process is clean, they need less water to clean it off. But I don't know about the balance. Maybe maybe Dr. Carl does. I think it would vary depending on uh, your local conditions. Certainly, I've actually been into the recycling centres and they ask me to get the message out: please clean it. Don't leave it stinky. And stinky is one thing and difficulty in getting it clean. And if you can't get it clean on the first couple of goes, they just chuck it anyway. So that's good. And it all depends, secondly, on your local water. Now, in my case, I've got an underground swimming pool at my place, about 40, 50,000 litres. And with where I happen to be, if I were allowed to use my water, which I have cleaned with filters on the way in and filters on the way out and ultraviolet and the local regulations do not allow me to use that for anything except for the garden and for toilets. But if I were allowed to use that, I could go entirely off the grid with regard to except using water. And so in that case, there would be no cost. So it all depends upon your local water supply. You guys in the United Kingdom, you got water to burn. Australia, we're as dry as a bone. We're the driest inhabited continent on earth. Thank you. Well, this is uh, now. This is on vaccines. We were mentioning this before we actually started recording today. Um, Amanda would like to know. She says, as vaccine uptake is plateauing in the UK and vaccine hesitancy, anti-vax views seem to be worryingly high in both the US and Australia. It's very interesting seeing, certainly the US, how state-bound that is. I mean, this huge variety depending on 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 the state. Uh, what do you think can be done to break through to a higher percentage of people? I'll start with you, Dr. Cole, because uh, I know the, the situation seems. From from our perspective, to have changed a great deal in in Australia in the last couple of months, or certainly the last month. Yeah. So, firstly, um, the people who um, don't take the vaccines, the medical people have a name for them. We call them the control group. <laughs> uh, that's a bit cruel. Um, secondly, it depends enormously on your background knowledge and your local group and your bigger society. So if, for example, you happen to be belong to the North Woi Woi, that is the name of a town in Australia, the North Woi Woi Sewing Club, and everybody there is happy with most of the times tables, but they don't accept the seven times tables. Six times is fine, eight times is fine, but not seven times. You'll end up drifting into their belief system. And then you go to the big scale of what the mass media is putting at you. And so in Australia, we've been having a combination, well, firstly, with regard to the Murdoch Press in Australia, they control 70% of the newsprint eyes. Uh, and for the last, most of the year, they've been you in glory in, in headlines about how dangerous and how bad these vac vaccines are and coming out with rather clever puns like Astra as in destroyed and uh, I won't go through all the clever puns. And the vaccine hesitancy was up at around 30% consistently. And then suddenly the order came through from God on high and across Australia, they started using the same logo and came out with the same message of get vaccinated and within three weeks, the hesitancy had dropped to 22%. So there are many, many factors involved. 
Helen, I wondered if you, because I was thinking about this the, the other day, if, if it can be very easy to, you know, mock people or attack people, for instance, on social media who are, you know, pushing their anti-vax line. But of course, a lot of people have been, you know, they've just been given the wrong information. They've been mis misled, haven't they? If they've got, as, as you were saying, if you're in the, if you end up in a certain kind of group, you may well find there's a huge amount of information and it's misinformation. Yeah, and I think as well, there's there's also a, a lag that, that takes place because in this case, you know, at the beginning, right when these vaccines were new, it's a perfectly reasonable question for anybody, whatever your opinions and scientific background to go, oh, well, this has happened quite quickly. Has it been tested thoroughly? Um, and if you were in the circles that got an accurate answer to that question, which is, yes, it's been through all the normal clinical trials. It's been through all the same processes. It's just been organized. So it happened more quickly. Then you get that message. But if you're out in the world, you, that's a very valid question. This is this has arrived very quickly. Um, should I trust it? And and if you haven't got those in between stages, um, you, you don't have a catch up. And I think that the other thing is that that it is a reasonable question. And if you have a reasonable, you, what you want is to connect up the reasonable answers with the reasonable questions. And that's what the internet has not been doing. It's like, you've got a reasonable question. And if all you get is kind of pushing and aggression and, oh, you're you're an idiot. Well, you've still got your reasonable question um, and nobody's answered it. So why should you, why should you sort of shift your thinking on that? So I think a lot of it, as, as Carl said, is communication. And, um, and the other thing that is interesting, and it's very sad, but it's interesting, it's going to be interesting in America is that, you know, we're already hearing cases of famous radio hosts who'd been anti-vaxxers who are, who have either had COVID very badly or died. But the start to, use, I mean, I feel that people will start to see the effects in their friends and family. It's one thing when someone's telling you that there's a disease on the other side of the world and you should have this vaccine because we're telling you you should. And it's quite another when people you know are suffering from this disease. And so, you, you, you have to, I think you're never going to change anything if you don't listen to the people who have the opposing view and actually get at what their real concerns are. Because if we're scientists, if we've got a scientific point of view, we can answer those questions. So why are we not being polite and answering the questions? And obviously, if you're pushing against a very anti-vax kind of thing, that, that there's a lot of aggression coming the other way. But in principle, what you've got is people who just want to be safe. And if you answer the questions um, in a non-aggressive way, we, we need to build bridges at this point, I think, to say, well, here's here's the information we have. Why do you think what you think? What do you what, what really worries you? We can show you. So I think there needs to be much more careful communication. And and otherwise, you know, the people who suffer are going to be the people who don't get vaccinated more than anybody else. And that that's not a, it's not a fair situation. People are talking about kind of a new type of Darwinism, but if they've been given bad information, you know, they're not stupid. They're not idiots. They do have reason. They are thinking. They just don't have all of the information, all the benefits of hearing lots of voices on it. And and we shouldn't point fingers and say they're idiots. I think. I mean, some of them, some of them will be will will have other reasons for causing problems. But if it's someone who's just not sure, then we can provide that information in a fair and honest way and let them make their decision. Um, but, you know, in, I think the worst thing that could happen is mandated vaccines, because then everyone's like, oh, well, why you do anyone who was hesitant before just becomes militantly against. So we just need to remember that these are human beings, you know, and it's really hard because it's really worrying for everyone else. Um, but it's all about the communication and we need to I do better. I heard a good, there was a good phrase where someone said that all the research she shows that uh, people well be evidence resistant, but it isn't true that people become evidence immune. Unless yeah. obviously you have a, you know, that 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 dogmatism which exists. And I think that's one of the things. I mean, I think one of the most reprehensible things is to see various news broadcasters, columnists, etc., who are peddling an anti-vax line while at the same time have been vaccinated. And that's where you yeah. I mean, that that bit of and, and I think I don't know if either of you have rules in terms of when you are sometimes discussing things on Twitter or whatever social media thing where because I find that some people you can just see you go, they've been given the wrong information and you might tweet them three or four different articles from from reliable sources and then normally by about the fifth tweet you find out if you've got a dogmatist and that the resistance is perhaps too great and i don't know if you you well, find how be, far 
it can be very, it can't take very much. So my mum told me the other day, she was, she said, oh, there's this, there's this guy I cycle with who's not very sure about vaccines and he's saying all these things. And she said, and I've told him all this stuff and he didn't pay any attention. And so this is, this is not, it's intended to be self-aggrandizing. It was just, just an interesting example. And she said, oh, and she said then, well, my daughter thinks it's real. And he was like, well, who's your daughter? And she said, oh, well, you know, she does all this stuff. And then this guy went and looked me up yeah. and he was like, oh, well, if she believes it, it must be all right. And, and it was just such an interesting example of, um, it doesn't take much, right? It doesn't necessarily take much. It's just a trusted someone who sounds like they're trustworthy. Then you know you've then you've got something you can believe in, and it's not just us and them. And I think that that's why. And there have been cases where this has been, you know, oh this person, you know, ed, and I'm not a vaccine expert. I do I can read scientific papers, but you know, and they've said, well, this person, you know, that's why there's been all these faces, right? All these different doctors, all these different respiratory cardiology, you know, respiratory consultants. They're all, these are all trusted people. And if you hear it from a trusted person, and it's just trusted people are different for everybody. And I think the more trusted people, whatever that is you have out there with the same message, the more you break these barriers down. So it's more about the trusted person than the message quite a lot of the time, I think. And as you said as well, it's not the, the intelligence thing. Uh, uh, there's been a lot in the in the press and in the media this week about the the man who was kind of filming himself saying, "I'm not going to take the the anti vax now. Now I've actually got COVID, and I'm glad the antibodies are going on." And then he died. He died in eleven days. And his wife's been appearing on various things saying, "I believed him." And you know, he was someone who had had a degree from Cambridge. And the other side of it, sometimes you say it's because someone's stupid, and sometimes it's because someone goes, "I'm so intelligent." Yeah. I and and both so you know it's it, it's the uh, more intelligent people are better at picking the evidence that supports their pre-existing view. That's what humans are really good at. Is they're really good at finding the thing that proves they were right after all. <laughs> Dot com. Um, with regard to young fit people dying, uh, we've had a few cases in Australia, and this this fits in with something that I learned when I used to work in the emergency departments. Now, in my case, I'm over the age of twenty five. And by a bit. And if I were to get attacked by some sort of nasty germ, I'd pretty, I'd show it pretty soon. And I don't have that much resilience. And I'd be getting sick, and people would be saying, "Mate, it's off to hospital for you, intensive care." But if you're young and fit, and this can apply to extreme blood loss, say trauma, car accident, you're bleeding internally, or being attacked by a disease, the resilience of somebody in their 20s is enormous. And they can just be going downhill very quickly, but superficially they're really good until they get overwhelmed by the massive viral load or blood loss, and then they fall off in hours. And we had a case in Australia where somebody was, and it was well documented, it was in their 20s and they got infected and they got visited by a community nurse at home while isolating every day. And on day 13, they got visited and they were they're fine. They're, they're, they're a bit off colour, you know, just not perfect. And they were dead within two hours. Whereas with me, I would have shown it a lot earlier with not that degree of resilience. So being young doesn't protect you from uh, a, a massive viral load. Thank you, Dr. Carl. Will, uh, will we go stay on, on health, actually, which is uh, Dean would like to know, why do you get pain around your body when you have cold or flu? Um, you're getting that's the difference between, between a, flu, a cold and a flu. A cold tends to be localized mainly to the upper respiratory tract. And you do get some degree of sensation there. But the flu virus is quite different and travels through your entire body and then gets attacked by your antibodies everywhere. And so it is classic that the cold will just give you a sniffly nose and you're feeling unwell. But if you've got sore muscles and joints, that means that the virus is in those areas and is being attacked by your antibodies. And then you get local effects such as inflammation. Now, for the average person, inflammation means a bit red, maybe may, may swollen. In medical school, it's three weeks. And you come out of the other end thinking, oh, my God, if you want to scare yourself, look up inflammation in Wikipedia. And when you get to the end of it, think, OK, that's what's happening around my body. No wonder I've got pain everywhere. Brilliant. Thank you. This is uh, where, right where uh, I'll start with you on this, Helen, because it's uh, it's more poo chat because Gemma has felt that we've oh, really been leaving facts. that. 
I've got a great poo fact. We'll do this, but I've got I discovered a great poo thing this week. Anyway, carry on. Just remember. Well, Gemma it. would like to know. So it's been a long time since there's been any poo chat on a Sunday. I reckon it's at least three weeks. Um, so I want to know why different mammals, regardless of size, have different sized poo. Kangaroos are huge, but do lots of little pellets. Dogs do human sized poo. Again, that does actually depend on 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 the dog. Uh, but cows do massive pats. Is it all just diet, Helen? Um, well, so there is there is a there are two things going on. One of them is the amount of whatever your food type is, it comes with some other stuff. Like there's the nutrients you want, and then there's other things around it that might be cellulose. They might, which is the sort of woody bit of plants. Um, it might be uh, just stuff your body can't use. It might be bits of bone or other things you've swallowed, and. Um, so all of that is going to be what's left over. So the first thing is that if you're a herbivore, for example, you need to eat a lot because grass is very nutrient poor. And so you're likely to have more coming out the other end because you, you can't use a, such a high proportion of what you've got. Um, and then the size of the animal will make a difference. I mean, if a dormouse produced anything the size of a cow pat, I think everybody would worry. Um, so I think the size of the animal does matter, but their diet, that, that how nutrient rich their diet is, is probably the critical uh, thing. And just on the topic of kangaroos, I will add my favourite poo factoid from this week, which is which I read uh, I read in a book, um, and uh, which I can't recommend yet, but I will soon. Um, and it and what this book says is that when and Dr. Carl probably knows about this when cattle were first farmed in Australia, um, they were brought to Australia from other countries, and because Australia is a dry country, as we've heard kangaroos and mammals in Australia produce very dry poo, but cattle produced very wet, sloppy poo. So when the cattle first turned up, the insects that normally process the poo and eat it and recycle it couldn't, didn't know what this wet, sloppy stuff was, so they just didn't do anything with it. So for the first few years of cattle in Australia, the cow poo just built up because the local recycling system was just, what is this? We don't know. And there's some statistic that um, at some point, the air, the area of Australia that was becoming newly covered in poo every year was two square kilometres just because the insect could not just didn't know what this was. And then somebody imported an insect that could process the wet, sloppy poo. And then Australia's poo problem went away. But I thought that was the most brilliant like example of why we should care about insects, because they recycle things and all the poo will build up if you don't have the insects that can process it. And you need the insects that are that can deal with your particular local style of problem. So, yes, that's my factoid for the week. Dr. Carl, further poo footnotes? Uh, yeah, it was the uh, dung beetle uh, brought in from Africa. Uh, and it was brought in by a Hungarian scientist. And so for the early days, the um, dung beetles were shifted around the place and fed uh, cattle poo. And it was given the name Meals on Wheels because they'd bring them around their, their dog poo, their, their cattle poo. Um, it, is, it has been claimed that all mammals poop in 12 seconds. And there was a paper and it turned out to be roughly two thirds of animals would poo between six and 25 seconds, which is not quite as good. But by the way, the article was called Hydrodynamics of Defecation, published by the Royal Society of Chemistry in one of their journals called, rather coyly, Soft Matter. And in Australia, we have the only known animal that has cuboidal poos, uh, does about 90 of them each night. They're roughly an inch or 25 millimetres across as the wombat. And people say, oh, they're uh, marking out their territory because the cuboidal poos won't roll away. But there are many animals that mark their territory with their feces, and yet only one has cuboidal poos. It's a mystery. I would highly recommend, obviously, for anyone who knows the children's book, uh, the story of the little mole who knew it was none of his business, which is about a mole trying to find who's pooed on their head. Um, also, there's a lovely, there's a, a, a story about, so I can't remember who it was, he used to share an apartment with George Clooney. And George Clooney had an interesting poo joke. They had a cat. And uh, or this, the, his, his flatmate had a cat and he would very carefully, George Clooney, when his cat was out, make sure that the cat litter tray was always clean so that his flatmate started to get really worried because he thought, what's wrong with my cat? My cat doesn't seem to go to the loo at any point. There's nothing around the house. But, and he would basically wait for two or three weeks. And then while his flatmate was out, George Clooney would then himself do an enormous poo in the cat litter tray uh, to see the panic on uh, his flatmate's face when he returned to think that there was something very big inside his cat, some kind of TARDIS-based uh, colon. Um, anyway, so there we go. We don't normally end on that. There's lots of questions that we didn't get to, but quite a few of them were about bubbles. 
so we will be able to get to those uh, next time. Uh, reminder that Dr. Carl's new book is uh, out now uh, about the little book of climate science, which uh, I always recommend Dr. Carl's books. They're, they're packed with really useful information and information that will take you off to lots of other places as well. They're very often kind of just part of a, of a great journey. Um, Helen, what are you up to this week? Oh, um, well, so I, I am recording some radio things and some fully charged things. I am finally getting to talk about tyre particulates and the pollution caused by uh, tyres wearing down. So I'll, I'll be filming that this coming week. So it should be out in a couple of weeks. But that I'm so I've been itching to talk about this topic for so long and it's taken a while for various reasons. But yes, so I will be talking about um, uh, how we can reduce tyre pollution, but not not quite yet, but soon. And there'll be more ocean podcasts and things. Well, brilliant. Dr. Oh. Carl? Is, is, is they, do they still reckon that the figure is that for 25,000 cars on one kilometre of road, that it will generate nine kilograms of tyre dust per day? Is that still the... There are no there are no good estimates and it depends. There are no universal estimates. It depends on the weather and the type of car and the driving style really matters and how well inflated your tyres are. And it's actually a really complicated issue, which is why it's taken me a long time to make these two episodes. Non-exhaust pollution is a massive thing that we should all be talking about more. But I'm going to make these episodes and then... The, you know, then then they'll be easier to talk about. But it's really complicated is the short version. It's a lot. The important thing we should know, not to hijack the end of the programme, is that um, the particulates, for the pollution, non-exhaust pollution will has already overtaken diesel pollution uh, wow. for at least some size classes. And within two or three years, it will be all of them. So tyres are a bigger problem than diesel particulates. Um, so, wow. yes, but more about that soon when, when I've uh, got these episodes out. Brilliant. I'm going to go off and I'm going to be doing the talking book of my next book, uh, The Importance of Being Interested. That's what I'm recording this week. And the, uh, that book is going to be available in October. And I'm doing a 100 bookshop tour, uh, starting at the, the bookshop of my childhood. I'm going to be signing books in Chorleywood Bookshop on uh, the 7th of October. And then I'm off to uh, Glasgow and Manchester and Penzance and Swansea and Margate and uh, about 94 other destinations. Uh, have a wonderful week. And uh, thank you as you usual to our producer Trent Burton and I'll be back with the A Billion Thoughts show at 8pm tonight which will be live and also have a Q&A. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.